I'm Carolyn Prasuti with the VOA Special English Technology Report. A new survey finds that more than 80% of Internet users in the United States search for health information online. The survey is from the Pew Research Center's Internet and American Life Project and the California Healthcare Foundation. Susanna Fox from the Pew Internet Project says doctors are still the main source of health information. But the survey found that searching online is one of the leading ways that people look for a second opinion. She said people are fact-checking what they have heard from a doctor. However, people are still very likely to turn to a health professional when they are planning a treatment. 44% of people are actually looking for doctors or other providers when they search for health information online. Another finding of the survey, two-thirds of internet users look online for information about a specific disease or medical condition. The Internet has also become an important source of emotional support for people with health problems. Susanna Fox says one in five Internet users has gone online to find other people who have the same condition. She said even more people with serious or rare diseases go online to find other people who share their health concerns. A disease is considered rare if it affects fewer than 200,000 people worldwide. The rise of social networking has made it easier for people with rare diseases to connect with each other and feel less alone. Social networking is also changing the way some doctors and patients communicate with each other. Dr. Jeff Livingston operates a medical center for women in Irving, Texas. His office uses password protected software to share information with patients. He says they provide patients full access to their medical care. Dr. Livingston says the software has increased efficiency, reduced costs, and improved relations with patients. He says it has just revolutionized the way we do health care. His medical center also has a Facebook page a MySpace page, and a Twitter feed. For VOA Special English, I'm Carolyn Prasuti. We would like to hear your stories about going online to search for health information. There's a lot of information out there. How do you know if you can trust what you find? You can also post your comments on our website, voaspecialenglish.com. This is the VOA Special English Development Report. The name sounds funny, but the idea is no joke. A personal toilet called the pee-poo. Anders Wilhelmsen is the Swedish inventor of the idea. He wants to give poor people in developing countries a simple way to improve their lives. The toilet is a single-use bag made of environmentally friendly plastics. The inside is treated with urea, a chemical commonly used as fertilizer. A natural reaction kills harmful organisms in the waste. It reduces the waste to fertilizer that Anders Wilhelmsen says is safe for growing food. The hotter the weather, 
the more quickly the waste breaks down into ammonia to be taken up by plants. Anders Wilhelmsen says the sanitation process can take as little as a couple of hours or as long as two to four weeks. He is an architect and a professor at Sweden's Royal Institute of Technology. He became interested in the idea of sanitation after taking part in a research project on the social and political development of cities. One of the most common complaints he heard in developing countries was the lack of toilets. He worked with others to design the invention. He launched the project in 2005 and the next year started a company called Pee Poople. The company is beginning production in Nairobi. It expects to start selling the bags in August in Kenya and Bangladesh. Full production could reach about half a million bags a day. People plans to sell the bags for two to three cents each. Anders Wilhelmsen says people can get back ten times what they paid by using the resulting fertilizer to grow vegetable gardens. The United Nations says more than two and a half billion people around the world do not have good sanitation. Many have no choice but to use the outdoors. Poor sanitation leads to infectious diseases that kill more than one and a half million people a year, mostly young children. Jack Sim is the founder of the World Toilet Organization, a nonprofit group working to improve conditions. He says the sanitation marketplace and inventions like this one are the best way to help people meet a most basic need. And that's the VOA Special English Development Report. You can find transcripts and MP3s of our programs at voaspecialenglish.com. You can also add your comments. From VOA Learning English, this is the Technology Report in Special English. Once again, consumer electronics topped the list of the most wanted gifts during the holiday season. Steve Koenig is with the Consumer Electronics Association. He says the group's latest research suggests that Americans increased their spending on technology products this year. Tablet computers were one of the best-selling products. Brian Tong is senior editor of CNET.com. The website reports on technology news and examines the latest electronic products. He says the Apple iPad Mini has been one of the most popular tablets. Prices for it start at $329. One of Apple's biggest competitors is the Google Nexus 7. Its prices start at $199. Brian Tong says the Nexus 7 has more powerful hardware than the iPad Mini and it uses Google Maps. But there is one reason why people may like the Apple product more than the Nexus 7. The iPad still has the largest group of high quality apps. Alman Chacon is with the electronic store Best Buy. He says smart cameras are also popular. 
they connect to the internet through Wi-Fi. This makes it easy for users to email or upload photographs directly from the camera. Streaming media boxes also connect to the internet. With the growing popularity of internet shopping, many consumers will visit a store first to look at a product and then go online to find it at a lower price. Many stores understand that. So, to keep customers, some stores offer to match lower prices that their customers find in other places within 30 days. For VOA Learning English, I'm Laurel Bowman. This is the VOA Special English Technology Report. America's video game industry was the winner in a decision by the United States Supreme Court. In late June, the justices rejected a law in California that banned the sale or rental of violent video games to people under 18. They said the 2005 law violated the free speech guarantee in the First Amendment to the Constitution. The vote was seven to two. The court decided that video games are a protected form of creative expression, like books, plays, and movies. Paul McGrail, dean of the University of Dayton Law School in Ohio, says California did not see gaming that way. The state of California tried to argue that this was not speech. It was more of an activity because children interact and play with the video games. And so it's not traditional speech like a book or like a magazine. California lawmakers argued that violent games are especially harmful to children. But the court said they were no more harmful than the violence in other forms of media. Justice Antonin Scalia wrote the majority opinion. He pointed to the violence in fairy tales like Snow White and Cinderella and in cartoons. Professor McGrail says the court sees its job as only to decide what is and is not legally protected speech. We don't want to get the Supreme Court into making fine distinctions about what is better than others, because that will lead us down a slippery slope. Once you start deciding that, what's to stop the government from saying that, for example, Grimm's fairy tales themselves are too violent, or that particular books should be banned. In fact, from 1915 to 1952, the Supreme Court permitted censorship of movies for fear they could be used for evil. Today, the film and music industries have voluntary rating systems, and so does the video game industry. For example, extremely violent games are rated M for mature. These are meant for ages 17 and older. Only 5% of the more than 1,600 games rated last year were rated M. Still, Abby Holleran, a manager at a GameStop store in Maryland, says M-rated games like Call of Duty, Halo, and Fallout are the most popular games in the store. She says parents have to give their permission for children to buy M-rated games. But the majority of the time, when we tell them what's in it, they don't. For VOA Special English, I'm Mario Ritter.
This is the VOA Special English Technology Report. We recently told you about a website called pastpages.org. It saves the home pages of 70 news websites from around the world every hour. That report led us to look for a website that saves images of newspapers from around the world. We found today's front pages, a site operated by the museum. The museum is a museum of news reporting and the media in Washington, D.C. Paul Sparrow is senior vice president with the organization. He says, one of the most interesting things about newspapers is that they are a snapshot in time. They capture a moment when the people working with a newspaper say these are the most important stories affecting our community. Paul Sparrow says visitors to the Today's Front Pages website can choose to see all of its newspapers or they can look only at newspapers from one area of the world such as Asia, Africa, or South America. Visitors can also sort newspapers by alphabetic order either by state or by country. Today's front pages does not archive or save front page images, but it does archive newspapers from historically important dates, such as November 5, 2008. That was one day after Barack Obama was elected president. Paul Sparrow says readers can learn a lot from the historical newspapers in the museum's collection. He says they will get a better understanding of the culture that existed long ago. The website shows only the front pages of general interest newspapers that publish daily. Student newspapers are not displayed. Some newspapers are not included because they do not have the technological ability to send their front pages electronically to the museum. And others simply choose not to do so. The site displays the front pages of 836 newspapers from 93 countries. It warns that the front pages are in their original unedited form and some may contain material that is deemed objectionable to some visitors. If you are in Washington, you can see many front pages from around the world on display inside and just outside the museum. Only about 10% of the front pages the museum receives every day are displayed, but all are available online. You can read and hear our reports online at voaspecialenglish.com. For VOA Special English, I'm Mario Ritter. I'm Alex Villarreal with the VOA Special English Development Report. Week after week, we bring you stories about projects to improve lives in the developing world. Projects like banking by mobile phone or low-cost lighting systems or even a toilet bag that recycles itself into fertilizer. But for every success story, there are countless other projects that fail. These are the stories that people talk about at an event called Fail Fair. The creators of the event recently held their second 
fail fair. Members of the nonprofit community came together in Washington to talk about their projects and why they failed. Fail fair is sort of like a celebration of failure. A prize is even given to the best worst story. But why celebrate? Katrine Verklaas is with a nonprofit group in New York called Mobile Active. She was the one with the idea for Fail Fair. She says the event provides an opportunity for people to learn from the mistakes of others. She says development is a field with finite resources, and so the less money we waste, the better. And part of that is learning from the things that didn't work, so that we don't endlessly repeat them. Mobile Active held its first fail fair in New York. Earlier this year, more than 70 people attended the event. One of them, for example, was there to talk about his failed nonprofit organization, MobileImpact.org. Bradford Frost had hoped to recycle used cell phones and provide them to people in Africa. Katrine Verklaas explained some of the problems with this project. And others like it. She says it did not work at all because of the numbers of very inexpensive handsets in the countries. She says they call that "sweedo" stuff we don't want. Fail fair takes place in a light-hearted social setting over food and drinks. Ms. Verklaas. Says the creator of a project is the one responsible for declaring it a failure. She says profit-making businesses talk more about failure than nonprofit organizations do. She says we have to report to donors, and donors do not like to look bad, and so we don't like to look bad as nonprofits. And so we have a tendency to highlight our successes and never talk about our failures. Katrine Verklaas says she hopes Fail Fair will change this problem over time. She says members of the nonprofit community have been surprisingly open to her idea. For VOA Special English, I'm Alex Villarreal. Transcripts and MP3s of our reports are at voaspecialenglish.com. From VOA Learning English, this is the Technology Report. Many sports competitions use cameras to help officials make the right call. Now, goal line technology is being used in international soccer. The move to goal line technology follows international pressure on football's governing body, FIFA, after a missed call in the 2010 World Cup. Video replays of a game clearly showed that England's Frank Lampard had scored a goal against Germany. However, that goal was denied. Because neither the referee nor the linesman saw the ball cross the goal line, the incident caused such an outcry that FIFA approved the development of goal line technology. That technology was used at the Confederations Cup in Brazil in June. Bjorn Linder. Is the chairman of Goal Control, the German-based company that won the Goal Line Technology contract for this year's Confederations Cup. His team spent weeks in Brazil before the games as part of the FIFA certification process. He says the system 
has 14 cameras connected to a computer. Computers track the path of the ball in real time and reconstruct the play. The system sends a signal to the referees through their watches when it finds that the ball has crossed the goal line. Electronic eyes on the goal line may settle arguments, but the data is still only a reconstruction of reality. Goal control claims an accuracy of plus or minus 5 millimeters. This is well below FIFA's minimum requirement of plus or minus 3 centimeters. Goal line technology may become a central part of the sport. But it is still the referee, not the computer, that makes the final call. For VOA Learning English, I'm Mario Ritter. This is the VOA Special English Technology Report. This year is the 75th anniversary of the Golden Gate Bridge in California. It opened to vehicle traffic on May 28, 1937. Since then, more than 2 billion vehicles have crossed the world-famous bridge linking San Francisco and Marin County. The bridge is named after the Golden Gate Strait. That narrow passage of water connects San Francisco Bay to the Pacific Ocean. The Golden Gate Bridge had the longest suspension span in the world at the time it was built. The suspended roadway stretches 1,280 meters between the bridge's two tall towers. Today, the Golden Gate still rates among the 10 longest bridge spans. Mary Curry works for the Golden Gate Bridge, Highway, and Transportation District. She says the bridge represents one of the most extraordinary engineering projects of all time. She calls it an engineering marvel and says it gets award after award for what it means in civil engineering and structural engineering. She says the Golden Gate Bridge is also a place where things happen first. For example, it was the first suspension bridge to have to change the roadway deck. The bridge is 27 meters wide and 2,788 meters long. Two large cables pass over the top of the bridge's towers. These structures stand 227 meters above the water and 152 meters above the road. Each cable holds more than 27,500 strands of wire. 250 pairs of vertical suspender ropes connect the support cables to the suspension bridge. This is part of what enables the bridge to move up and down by nearly five meters. The project took four years to complete. Work began in 1933. The Golden Gate Bridge weighed more than 800,000 metric tons when it was completed. The San Francisco Chronicle newspaper called it a $35 million steel harp. Joseph Strauss was the chief engineer of the Golden Gate Bridge project. But architect Irving Murrow gets credit for its bright orange color, known as international orange. The Navy wanted the bridge painted in yellow and black. The Air Force had suggested red and white. 
But Mary Curry says Irving Moreau knew that orange would blend with the environment. It would contrast with the ocean and the air above. And it would also allow the Art Deco styling to really stand out. For VOA Special English, I'm Carolyn Prasuti. This is the VOA Special English Technology Report. Privacy activists are concerned about Google's new privacy policy as of March 1st. The company says one main policy is replacing more than 60 separate policies for different products. Activists say the changes will make it easier to track the activities of users across Google's many products, from Gmail to YouTube. Mark Rotenberg heads the Electronic Privacy Information Center in Washington. He says Google's aim is to create a single unified profile of its users. We believe that not only is that a threat to privacy, we actually believe it is illegal because last year Google entered into an agreement with the U.S. Federal Trade Commission in which they said they would not engage in that kind of data sharing without the explicit permission of their users. Google says its new policy will make it simpler for users to share information across services like Google Search, Gmail, and Google Calendar. And it says the new policy will help personalize each user's experience. Over time, it says users can expect to see better search results, fewer unwanted advertisements, and more content targeted to their interests. But Mark Rotenberg says, in return, people who choose to use Google will lose control over the information they share. The type of information you might provide for an email service, for example, such as your address book, is different from the type of information that you might provide for a social network service. Mr. Rotenberg says these two kinds of services should be kept separate. In our view, Google is actually undermining a very well-established expectation of privacy, particularly for popular internet services like electronic mail. Critics also see a bigger problem with Google's new policy. The plan would not give users a choice to opt out of the data sharing. Mr. Rotenberg says, in our view, if people want to make their personal information available, they certainly should have the right to do that. What we're objecting to is the effort by the company to take away from the users that choice that they should have. Google says it will not be collecting any more data than it does now. And it says, users will still be able to control many privacy settings. For example, they can disable their search history and set Gmail chat to off the record. European Union officials have asked the company to delay the new policy to make sure it would not violate any EU data protection laws. For VOA Special English, I'm Mario Ritter. I'm Mario Ritter with the VOA Special English Technology Report. A shortwave radio might seem like ancient technology these days, but for some people it remains their only link to the wider world. Ears to Our World is an organization based in the United States. It provides shortwave radios to schools and communities in some of the poorest areas of the world.
The radio is small, about the size of a book, and self-powered. Users turn a crank. Winding it for two minutes provides about 40 minutes of listening time. Ears to Our World is supported by private donations and partners including Eton, the company that makes the Eton Grundig radios. Thomas Witherspoon started Ears to Our World in 2008. He said, our radios are going to people who have no other source of international news and information. It's hard for them to learn new languages and be connected to the bigger world. He said teachers use this information in the classroom to help students learn about the world around them. Ears to Our World works with local organizations to get the radios to where they are needed most. Mr. Witherspoon says the radios are now in 11 communities, most of them in Africa. He says many of these communities are unable to get information any other way. He takes the radios to parts of the world that lack access to the internet or to a national power grid of any kind. These include communities and villages in South Sudan, where people do not have power in their homes. Thomas Witherspoon says information is the most important tool to improve the lives of poor people. The self-powered radios are also useful in emergencies. Teachers in Haiti use them to get information after last year's earthquake. Mr. Witherspoon says Ears to Our World has sent out about 1,200 radios. More than half have gone to earthquake victims, mostly in Haiti. About 500 have gone to individual teachers and schools. More recently, Ears to Our World worked to bring the radios to children with vision problems in Belize. He said having a radio that they can control and listen to and search around on, it just opens a world of information to them. For VOA Special English, I'm Mario Ritter. You can read and listen to all of our reports at voaspecialenglish.com. You can also join us on Facebook at VOA Learning English. I'm Alex Villarreal with the VOA Special English Technology Report. In January, a five-day internet shutdown in Egypt failed to stop the protests that forced President Hosni Mubarak to resign. But it raised a technical question. Just how were Egyptian officials able to shut down internet service in their country? Craig Labovitz is chief scientist at Arbor Networks an internet security company in the American state of Michigan. Mr. Labovitz says the internet is not as indestructible as people might think. He says there are points where the flow of computer traffic can be restricted. Mr. Labovitz says his researchers tracked the internet shutdown in Egypt as it was being carried out. He explains that in Egypt, internet users connect to the outside world through a small number of providers with international links. He said there are a hundred or more providers within the country, domestic providers. But there really are only four providers that have links to the external world. 
And there are an even smaller number of data centers where the fiber optics cross Egypt. So only a handful of machines need to be shut down to have this kind of disruption. News reports suggested that the fiber optic links for those networks are all housed in the same building. Could a similar internet shutdown take place in the United States? Craig Labovitz says that is less of a possibility because of a larger number of internet providers and data centers. Still, the recent shutdown in Egypt has raised new concerns about a proposal in the United States Congress. Critics say the legislation could make similar action possible in America. The measure is known as the Protecting Cyberspace as a National Asset Act. Senator Joseph Lieberman of Connecticut first proposed the bill last June. Supporters say it would help protect the country's economic and national security from cyber attack. It would give the president the emergency power to shut down or seize parts of the nation's internet in the event of a major threat. Critics say the bill would give the president too much power. Some people call it the kill switch bill, an easy way to shut off the internet. They say the government could use it to censor the web and control the flow of information. For VOA Special English, I'm Alex Villarreal. Transcripts, MP3s, and podcasts of our reports are at voaspecialenglish.com. And we're on Facebook at VOA Learning English. From VOA Learning English, this is the Technology Report. The internet company Google is testing its newest device, Google Glass. Most of the technologies for Google Glass are already available on smartphones. What is different is that Google has taken those technologies and added them to eyeglass frames. Chris Dale is the senior manager of communications for Google Glass. He says the device is a very small computer that sits in a lightweight frame and is positioned above the eye. He says it makes exploring and sharing the world around you easier. The glasses have a tiny video screen and camera that connect wirelessly to the internet through Wi-Fi, a smartphone, or a tablet computer. You can make and receive calls, send and receive texts, take pictures, record video, or search the web. You control Google Glass using your voice and a touchpad on the right temple arm of the frame. Professor Marsha Dawkins is among a group of people who have tested Google Glass. She thinks she could use the device in her classroom. Her Google Glass looks like a pair of bright orange glasses, but without the lenses. There is a tiny rectangular glass at the top right corner. She has been recording videos while biking. She has also been able to talk to her sister in Thailand. But not everyone is excited about Google Glass. Some are concerned about risks to privacy. They say the device will make it easy to video people without their knowledge. 
There are also concerns about the use of facial recognition technology. Google says it will not approve the use of such applications. The company says it is still testing Google Glass and hopes to make it available by early next year. For VOA Learning English, I'm Alex Villarreal. This is the VOA Special English Development Report. Manute Bowl played 10 years in the National Basketball Association, but he will be remembered as much for his basketball playing as for his charity work in Sudan. He died June 19th from kidney failure and a rare and painful skin disorder. He became sick while working in his homeland. He was 47 years old. A funeral took place at Washington's National Cathedral. Manute Bol was born in southern Sudan. He stood 231 centimeters tall. This is tall even for a Dinka, some of Africa's tallest people. His father, a tribal chief, did not think basketball was good work for a Dinka, but the teenager chose it over herding his family's cattle. He did not have much luck, though, the first time he went up to dunk the ball. As he once told the Washington Post, when I came down, I hurt my teeth in the net. In the NBA, Manute Bowl averaged fewer than three points a game on offense. But on defense, he became one of the most feared shot blockers in the league. Former player Rory Sparrow says Bowl was not afraid of anyone, not even Michael Jordan. Sparrow says Bowl once said, Why should I be afraid of Michael Jordan? I kill lion. He come in, I block his shot. Manute Bull finished his career as the 14th best shot blocker in NBA history. He enjoyed his fame, but he never forgot his people. Years of civil war left southern Sudan in ruins. He estimated that he lost 250 members of his extended family. He helped raise money for refugees. Reports say he donated nearly all of the estimated $6 million he made playing basketball. Before his death, he was working with the Sudan Sunrise Group to help bring the country together. His goal was to build 41 schools. Manute Bol took his Christian faith seriously. God guided me to America and gave me a good job, but he also gave me a heart so I would look back, he said in Sports Illustrated magazine in 2004. That year, Manute Bol broke his neck in a car accident. He was thrown from a taxi. After recovering, he moved to the state of Kansas and met United States Senator Sam Brownback. Senator Brownback said he cannot think of a person in the world who used his or her fame for a greater good than what Minute Bowl did. He said he gave his life for his people. And that's the VOA Special English Development Report. From VOA Learning English, we bring you news about technology in Special English. The World Bank estimates there are about 650 million mobile phone users in African countries south of the Sahara Desert. That is greater than the number of users in the United States, 
and the European Union. Samia Melham works for the World Bank to increase information technologies in Africa. She says mobile phones are Africa's fastest growing technology. She says more Africans have access to the internet than to clean water or sanitation. She says mobile technology has brought about huge changes in how people live. CNN television recently named seven ways life has been revolutionized by mobile phones. They include political activism, education, entertainment, disaster management, agriculture, and health. Banking is another industry that has been transformed by mobile phones. Reports say at least half of the adults in Gabon, Kenya, and Sudan use mobile money. Renee Mendy sells goods in the streets of Dakar, Senegal. But he never had enough money to open a bank account. Now, he uses a mobile phone banking service called Orange Money. With his telephone, he can add or take out as little as one dollar from his account. He can make payments and send money to family members who live far away. Orange Money says it serves four million customers in 10 countries. The World Bank's Samia Melham notes that the French company is facing competition from other mobile banking services. That is not a surprise. The cost of sending a payment by phone is far lower than with traditional transfer agents like Western Union. For VOA Learning English, I'm Laurel Bowman. This is the VOA Special English Technology Report. Children can spend hours a day looking at computer screens and other digital devices. Some eye care professionals say all that screen time has led to an increase in what they call computer vision syndrome. Nathan Bonilla Warford is an optometrist in Tampa, Florida with VSP, Vision Service Plan, a big insurance provider. He says, I see a lot more children who are coming into the office either because their parents have noticed that they have headaches or red or watery eyes or discomfort or because their prescription, their nearsightedness, appears to be increasing at a fast rate and they're worried. Dr. Benilla Warford says part of the problem is that children may be more likely than adults to ignore early warning signs. Even if their eyes start to feel uncomfortable or they start to get a headache, they're less likely to tell their parents because they don't want to have the game or the computer or whatever taken away. He says another part of the problem is that people blink less often when they use digital devices. The average person who uses a computer or an electronic device blinks about a third as much as we normally do in everyday life. So the front part of the eye gets dry. Eye doctors offer suggestions like following what is known as the 20-20-20 rule. Every 20 minutes, look away 20 feet or more for at least 20 seconds from whatever device you're using. 20 feet, that's six meters. Other suggestions 
include putting more distance between you and the device and using good lighting. Of course, you could also spend less time looking at screens. Many experts say children should spend no more than two hours a day using digital devices, with no screen time for children under two. But not all eye doctors have noticed an increase in problems in children. Dr. David Hunter says he has not seen an increase in his practice as a pediatric ophthalmologist at Children's Hospital Boston. He also serves as a spokesman for the American Academy of Ophthalmology. Dr. Hunter thinks calling it a syndrome, as in computer vision syndrome, is a little much. He says the real problem is simple spending too much time in one place focusing on one thing. And while this might be tiring to the eyes, he says, there's certainly no evidence that it actually causes any damage to the eyes. For VOA Special English Technology Report, I'm Alex Villarreal.